Thank you for tuning in to the first compilation of Working Man Games episodes. I'm Stuart K. Riley, and these are my videos. If you want timestamps to see a certain episode, they will be in the description. Now let's start the compilation. Ah, Ocean Software. AVGN has LJN. CV11 has Capstone. I have Ocean Software. When I see that little blue logo, I know this game is gonna suck some real big balls. And they had such a big catalog of games, I knew I could make an entire video just about them. So I did, and here it is. Ocean Games. Yeah, these games belong in the ocean. So when you think of licensed movie tie-in games, what company pops in your head? LJN? THQ, Sunsoft, well before all of them, there was one king of licensed movie games that churned them out faster than Grant McDonald puts out more installments of Ram Ranch. That company was Ocean Software. Ocean started out making clones of arcade games to 80s microcomputers like the Commodore 64 and ended up making official licensed ports of games later on, including a Nintendo approved version of Donkey Kong. But later around 1986, their focus shifted to movie tie-in games. Now, movie games were nothing new. Atari had made plenty of movie games, including this little bastard, but the game industry crash never happened in the UK, where the Brits were happily playing away at their movie games, 90% of which were made by Ocean. Back then, movie licenses weren't near as expensive as they are now, especially for movies that weren't even out yet because they hadn't become popular yet. So Ocean could buy a license for these movies for a fairly small amount, and if the movie became popular in the box office, they would make a killing off the game. It was a risky move, and sometimes it didn't pay off. Off, but when it did, it did. Their biggest financial success would be with their RoboCop game, which I reviewed the Spectrum version of in my last video. This game got put on everything. The NES, the arcade, Amiga, Atari ST, Game Boy, PC, Apple II, Commodore 64. Whew and more. I was gonna review the Commodore 64 version for this game, but holy shit balls! they made this game extremely hard. There's so many freaking guys shooting at you at once, your health gets drained extremely quick. You do get some health pickups for killing enemies, but it's completely RNG if they'll show up at all. And on top of all that, you get one life, no continues, and you have a time limit. All I could think was, why is this game so unfair and difficult? Well, it turns out on the C64 version, this was completely intentional. The game is unfinished. They never got around to making level three of the game. It's there, but not done. So instead of delaying the game to get it finished, they made the game insanely hard and impossible to beat, so you couldn't even get to level three. In fact, Level 2 has an intentionally short time limit that makes it so it's impossible to finish the level. However, the game is so broken that you can glitch through a wall and skip most of the level and then finish it. And what do you see when you get to level three? This! Welcome to the Pixel Puke Zone, Population Robocop. You know, it's common now for companies to release a broken, unfinished game and call it good, but it's really surprising to see this shit happened even back then before day one patches were a thing. When you bought a game and it was a broken piece of shit, it was just always a broken piece of shit, and you were out 20 bucks or whatever. So now that I've set the stage and you know the quality of games that we're dealing with here, let's take a deep dive into the sea of shit that is Ocean Game. Let's start where I left off last episode on the ZX Spectrum. Don't worry, we won't be here long. One day a giant meteor will take us all out. But until then, here's Cobra. Okay, that gun does not make any sense. Oh, it actually looks like that, huh? It's still ugly, though. <laughs> Ah, right up there with Beethoven. Now, I haven't seen the movie Cobra, but does Stallone run around town at night headbutting people and getting attacked by baby carriages full of bombs? If he does, I really need to see this movie. And now he's jumping around on a jungle gym with rockets and knives being thrown at him. One hit death, by the way. But would you expect any less from a Spectrum game? Headphone check. <laughs> Game under. That is the best thing I've seen all day. We're making a shirt out of that one. I think that's enough out of this game. If I want to play a Stallone game, I'll play Italian Stallion on the Game Boy Advance. Highlander. Now this is considered Ocean's worst movie game they ever made. We'll see about that. You and a bro are fighting each other 1v1 with swads, and you keep hitting him with the swad till you chop his head off. Or more realistically, he chops your head off and you quit the game out of frustration. It's hard to even tell if you're doing anything. 
anything, really. If it weren't for the health bar in the bottom, I wouldn't even know if my attacks are landing or not, and half the time they don't. It feels like no matter what you try to do, you can't really get anything to happen. And if I do hit him, I don't know how I did it, and that seems to be the general consensus of this game. You can't really tell if you're doing anything or not, and the controls only work half the time. Well, there can be only one thing you do with this game. Throw it in the garbage. Navy SEALs on the Commodore 64. I've never even heard of this movie, but it was apparently a Charlie Sheen movie from 1990. From what I gather, you're supposed to put bombs on these military crates, and you need to find them all before the timer runs out. Easier said than done, though, because this is another one-hit death game, and there's enemies hiding every which way, and you can only shoot one direction. You can't shoot up or down or anything. You can only shoot forward, so that makes it really hard to actually shoot anything. By the time I get done crawling off this crate, this guy's done already shot me. So you find yourself having to try to figure out some kind of special path where you won't get shot at. Man, I cannot stand games that have a one-hit death. There's no reason for it other than to make the game unneedlessly difficult. And yeah, you could say, oh, well, they wanted to make the game more realistic. It's a fucking video game. Fun is more important than realism. If the realism hurts the fun, get rid of the realism. You want a realistic game? You really want a realistic game? How about a game where you die from cancer? How about a game where you're put in jail for not paying your taxes? How about a game where you become homeless because your 9 to 5 job doesn't pay the rent? That's realism, baby. And you can call the game Die. The game is called Die. And get From Software to make it. Fund it, start a Kickstarter, whatever. We're making Die. Short Circuit. Number 5. Stuck in Shit Game. Shit. Defecation. Feces. Fecal matter. Damn, why does every game I play recently want to take an ice pick to my ears? I don't have a lot to say about this one because I never could figure it out. This might be one of those games where you need the whole keyboard and RetroArch only lets you use the joystick because all I could do was examine things and I never did find anything. Hot damn, this music is fucking me in the ear with no lube. I do give them kudos for trying to do music from the movie, though. I found one of the other robots, but I never could figure out how to get past him. I tried to go to the left side of the screen, and I got captured and disassembled. You would think I'd be able to go through this door, but I never could figure out how. So I chalked it up to this is a game you need the keyboard for. So I can't really review this one. It gave me a good laugh, though. Next, let's go over to the Amiga with Red Heat. And holy shit, this music sounds like male strip music. Uh, this ain't a porn game, is it? Yeah, this ain't nothing weird about this. It's a bunch of guys in a sauna, naked, beating the shit out of each other while rocks fall on their head. Does this happen in Red Heat? Is it a porn movie? Oh, it's a, that's an ass! That is an ass! That is an ass! Ass confirmed! Oh, wait, this is an Arnold movie? They made Arnold a Russian man? hard boss. This is the most homoerotic game I've ever seen since Metal Gear Solid 4. Well, I guess I better review it. Well, the punching is okay, but it's hard to dodge anything, especially these rocks falling from the sky, and you can get caught up in a stun lock where they're steadily beating the shit out of you. I never got to the end of this level, but I want to believe the whole game is just this, beating a bunch of naked men to death. Oh, check out Stallone over here. Arnold is beating up Stallone. What more could I say about this game that it isn't already saying itself? <laughs> My review of this is, if you want a game that's got a whole bunch of buff naked men, you could do a lot worse than Red Heat. Now let's play Batman the Movie on Amiga. Oh, my right ear really likes this song. That was something with some Amiga soundtracks. They had weird stereo separation. Oh, there we go. Wait, what the fuck? I'm Batman. I'm Batman. So this game was packaged with a lot of Amigas. You could buy an Amiga 500 in the Batman pack and get this game. The only attack you have is your Batarang, which you can only throw straight forward, while all the bad guys can shoot wherever the hell they want to. But nobody would ever accuse an ocean game of being fair. You use your grappling hook to go up to the higher levels. I wasn't able to make it very far in this game because I really don't know where I'm supposed to go. And every time I make a little bit of progress, I end up getting killed. Then I gotta start all over again. It wouldn't 
wouldn't be so bad if everything didn't all look the same. Overall, it's okay. I guess it would be okay if you had enough time to spend on it. Like, if you had an Amiga and this was your game, you'd be more apt to try to finish it. But it just didn't hold my attention. I'm not a cat. You can't just dangle some keys in front of me and make me entertained. Playing this does make me want to watch the movie, though. Let's move over to the NES with the Adams Family. And my god, you think Fester's Quest is bad? Wait till you play this shit. The game's at least nice enough to give you hints, otherwise you'd have no idea how to play this damn game. The game is kind of set up like a Metroidvania where it's all one big level with a bunch of locked doors, and you gotta get keys to progress. The object is to find all your family members, and I think when you find them you can play as them, I'm not sure. The game cranks up the difficulty pretty early on, and immediately starts hitting you with grade A bullshit. Oh f- are you kidding me? Oh. So I go through this crypt trying to see if there's anything I can collect. Oh, it's just more money for more points, huh? You know what? You know what? No. Fuck that. We're going through this door. What? Oh my fuck. Okay, I see how this game is now. You gonna do me like that, huh? Well, bring it, daddy. I love it when you spank me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got you figured out, game. Yeah, go ahead with the little spikes. And we've collected a bone. Boner get. Boner. And then there's these guys that throw shit at you from the windows and are really hard to dodge. Well, I found the key. Let's get in the house. Oh, you mother. Man, whoever designed this game really was a little shit. I hope your house burns down and your wife leaves you because she can't be married to a man who whose house burnt down. That's gonna come alive and kill me. Yep. Ah, nice. Well, there's nothing in here but money bags anyway, so what's the point of even coming in here? Ah, no bad platformer would be complete without an ice physics room. And that was my last life and last continue. At least this game gives you lives and continues, so I can't fault it for that. But I can sure fault it for this shitty ice room. So in this part, you're supposed to get in these spots where you can jump to dodge the snowballs, but the collision detection is very fucked up on the ceiling. Sometimes you'll jump normally, or sometimes you'll hit an invisible ceiling. Like right there, I was in the same spot. And these platforms can go to hell. They give you a really short amount of time for you to jump on each one. You gotta time it perfect. You can't be a millisecond off. So I saved Wednesday, but now I gotta get back off this platform. I gotta go all the way back the way I came. Come on, come on. Oh, I made the platform. Oh wait, I'm not gonna make it. Oh! That's enough out of this game. Kiss my hairy gray ass. Platoon. Now, Sunsoft published the NES version, but Ocean made it. There's also a C64 version of this game. In fact, some C64s were bundled with this game. But we're playing the NES one because if I play one more microcomputer game, I'm gonna puke. This game has got some really cool music thanks to David Whittaker. <laughs> As you can imagine, the C64 version sounds even better. That's more than what I can say about the game itself, though. If you have no idea what's going on, you're gonna run around endlessly like you're blind as a Viagra addict, trying to find a way out of this jungle maze. This is one of those games that could have really used a map or you need to draw one out yourself. What you're supposed to do is find some explosives hidden in the maze, and then you gotta take them to a bridge and then blow that bridge up. I found the explosives, but I never found the bridge. I wandered through this godforsaken maze for lord knows how long until I was finally sick of it. At least the enemies aren't very hard. They're a bigger pushover than a cow on rollerblades. I would know. And you kill them in one hit, so it's like, it's nothing. So if you did draw yourself a map or knew where the explosives and the bridge were, this game would probably be kind of easy. From what I've seen, the levels after this are completely different. One of them has you running around in a tunnel then you've got a shooting stage, and then this pseudo top-down thing. So there might be a decent game in here for you if you're able to keep going, but I couldn't keep going. There's somebody that can play this game, but it ain't me. It ain't me.
the untouchables. Yeah, the most obvious joke would be the unplayable, but the game honestly isn't that bad. The game starts you off with a shooting gallery where you have to shoot two times and then reload. You have to kill a certain amount of enemies before the time limit. I feel like the cursor is a little bit slow, but then again, my mind is a little bit slow. My only gripe is he reloads his gun by pumping it, but the gun is semi-automatic and only holds two rounds. The hell kind of gun is this? Then there's this level where you're shooting a bunch of bottles over and over. Yo, know, I can't help but feel like these levels would be a lot more fun with the zapper. Light gun support would have made this game a lot better. Kind of a missed opportunity. I wonder if there's some drunk idiot out there who tried to play duck hunt with a real gun. Like they're freaking hammered out of their mind and instead of grabbing the zapper, they grabbed a real gun and then blew a hole in their TV. I mean, there's a few guns out there that kind of look like the zapper. I mean, if you were drunk enough, I wish I could find somebody that could make me a holster for a zapper. That would be cool. And then finally, you have this one stage where you gotta kill the guy in the gray hat. You don't run very fast, but you jump faster than somebody who just played the screamer maze for the first time. Look at that hoppity hop. He hops like a man possessed. Yeah, get after it, Ness. Yeah, his name is Ness, no relation. And then it just repeats the same three stages over again. So it's kind of got that arcade deal going on of you kind of just play it until you're bored of it. But you know what? I dig it. But this next one, the only thing I dig is a hole to bury it in. Hook. Oh man, this game. Have you ever accidentally figured out a puzzle in a game or ran around blindly trying to figure out what to do and you just happen to stumble upon it? I wish that would have happened to me playing Hook. I stumbled around this freaking game for an hour trying to figure out what the hell I'm supposed to do. One thing I've noticed about ocean games, they hate the basic idea of a side-scrolling platformer that just goes from left to right and you just keep going till you hit the goal. You know, like a normal sane person makes? No, no, no. They have to make it complicated. In their games, you have to walk around in the huge piss maze of Shitterbond looking for the five magic turds of King Fuck Yourself. That's at least 80% of their games. It can't just be a simple game. Oh, no. Well, in this game, as far as I can tell, you have to collect every item in the level and then go to the exit. Now, you've got a knife that you can kill enemies with, but then you pick up this metal detector and it disables your knife. So I gotta just let this guy hit me. That's just bullshit. That's like if Mario collected a mushroom and now he can't jump anymore. Or if my dick got bigger and now it doesn't fit in any holes. Then there's this water level where it could be a lot worse than it is. My main problem is this anxiety inducing music it has. Ah, diminished and chromatic scales. The worst scales in music. This game is like when you take a shit and the shit is so big that it splashes in the water and the water goes up your rectum. It's like a natural bidet. All right, last NES game before we move on to Super Nintendo, and it's Jurassic Park. Now, the music in this game was done by Jonathan Dunn, and it's really freaking good. So this game is another classic ocean scavenger hunt. You gotta find all the dinosaur eggs and then go to the exit. But honestly, the game isn't that bad, at least on these levels. The gun is kind of weird. What is it even supposed to be? Some kind of bazooka? And it doesn't shoot directly in the center of you. It like shoots at an offset. In addition to the dinosaur eggs, sometimes you gotta get key cards. Mother key cards. Then you can go inside the buildings and get the rest of the eggs. Now, like I said, this part of the game isn't bad. The part that's bad is this. These triceratops are trying to run over you and you gotta avoid them. And you've got somebody else with you and you gotta make sure they don't get run over too. It's a really aggravating part of the game and it only gets worse from here. Because in another level, you gotta fight a T-Rex and the only way to shoot him is in the head. And his hitbox for his head is so damn small. And even then, sometimes you're shots don't even connect when you obviously shot him. And you gotta keep this other guy from getting eaten by him. Ugh. This part, it's just, it's just bad, man. He goes so fast, you go so slow, he can kill you in one hit, it's bullshit. It may be easier to fight a real T-Rex than to fight this some bitch. I really wanted to like this game too, but because of this shit right here, I gotta say, don't play this piece of crap. Instead, go dry hump a cactus, you'll have more fun. But what about Jurassic Park on the Super Nintendo? Well, now your bazooka thing is a cattle prod. You still gotta look for dinosaur eggs, but this time, 
time, you've got an open world to run around in. You got tons of different weapons to choose from, and you'll need them to take care of all the raptors and spitters you'll find. The game pretty much has a set path it wants you to go on, and it will give you hints from time to time, but in all god honesty, you will need a strategy guide to play this game. Shout out to Starfighter76, who has made a map of literally every video game in the world at this point. When you enter a building, you're greeted by this first-person perspective that's very akin to Wolfenstein 3D in that there's no floor or ceiling, just walls. Believe it or not, this game actually predates Doom by two months. Jurassic Park SNES came out in October of 93, and Doom came in December. And I gotta say, even as jank as it is, it still runs better than Doom on the Super Nintendo did. These first-person levels all have this eerie music to them, and the only thing you hear other than that is the sound of the dinosaur. So it's got a bit of a spooky factor to it. I'm not gonna lie, people. I like this game. I liked it as a kid. I like it now. Even with all its jank, all its difficulty, and as cryptic as it is, I can see past that and have fun with it. But there is one thing that kills this game for a lot of people, and it does for me too. This is a very long game, and they expect you to finish it all in one sitting. Because of that, there's no save feature, and this game really bad needs a save feature. I mean, thanks to emulation, you got save states, of course. But on your butt, on the couch, playing your Super Nintendo, you didn't have it. Unless you had one of those funky game saver peripherals, which I used to have. It was a little battery-powered rig that let you have save states, but you would lose them once you took the batteries out, which I forgot to do for 10 years and ruined the damn thing. Anyway, that's all I got to say about Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo. Play it, but on emulator so you can save. And make sure you get a strategy guide. You're gonna need it. It. Mighty Max. Oh my god. This might be the worst game I played for this video. This was a steaming pile of chicken shit. Again, same typical ocean game. Collect things, go to the exit. Only this time, you've got to pick them up one by one and then take them to an exit portal. Dear god, what is this jump? Your gun only shoots one direction and when you jump to try to hit an enemy that's higher than you, you shoot up like a fat guy that farted his way to the moon and can't aim for shit. This jump is ridiculous. I thought something was wrong with my emulator for a second. And you would think these ricocheting bullets would actually hit something. No, they never do. They don't even kill anything anyway. They just stun things. You know what this all feels like? It feels like you gave a hyperactive child five monster energy drinks and a gun. Well, I found one of the items I'm supposed to collect, but it doesn't help that every single enemy in the area is trying to kill me. It's like after they find you, they keep fighting following you to the bitter end. And since you can't kill them, you can only stun them. They're just always there, being a little bitch. Oh, nice. You can't jump while holding the item. The one thing I would really need to do, because I found the exit portal and it's above me. So what the hell am I supposed to do now? The exit portal is on the platform above me and I can't reach it. And before you say, try throwing it on the balloon, I tried that. It didn't work. Oh, apparently this kills stuff. Okay. Doesn't get me any closer to my goal. It's like every single one of these platforms are just out of reach. I am at a complete loss. I don't know what this game wants me to do. You know what I am going to do? Go to E621 and look at some lichen rocks. But after that, I'm deleting this game. The Adams Family Pugsley Scavenger Hunt. Guys, take a wild fucking guess what you do in this game. The same thing that you do in the last four games I reviewed. Go through non-linear levels and collect items. We need to come up with a name for this. We should call it Ocean-like. Any game where you run around in confusing levels trying to find items and then go to a goal? Yeah, that's an Ocean-like. In this game, there was a lot of levels I couldn't really make any progress in. I wonder if it's like if I need an item or something to get past those levels or something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. I want to stop playing these games. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have anything interesting to say about it. It's the same shit, different sprites. It's like they had this tired old formula that they kept recycling over and over and making tons of different games with it with licenses. And I for one am sick of it. Let's play something different. There has to be something different. Let me look here. Uh, uh, hey, get, out, get, out of the, get out of the way. Uh, okay. I got something different. Apparently, Ocean made a mascot platformer. And his name is... <laughs> <laughs>
His name is Mr. Nuts! <laughs> You're gonna love Mr. Nuts! It's a good sign of what Mr. Nuts is all about when you've got these trees that look like a gaping asshole and a dick! <laughs> You know, for kids. Oh, look at here, you can make him dance. Dance your nuts off, Mr. Nuts. Oh, look what they did. They took the dick tree and then mirrored it. It's a double dick tree. Huh, <sighs> okay, Stu, take this review seriously for once. That, 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 that's goatsy. That's just straight up a goatsy. Is that what I think it is? Aw, oh, shit, Nintendo's gonna be pissed. So Mr. Nuts is finally what I've been asking for, a simple, no-bullshit platformer. Man, Ocean must have been so upset over the fact the levels made sense and the graphics don't all look the same and there was no items to collect. This game had to be hard for them to make. It's just you walk from one spot to the other spot, avoid some enemies, and get to the goal. That's what a 2D platformer is supposed to be. You you don't have to overcomplicate the shit. That's not to say I don't have some problems with it. I hate these fucking enemies that throw these yellow balls at you. They throw them so fast and there's no way to kill them. If those enemies weren't in the game, this game would actually be a lot easier. And you would think, oh, it's got these cutesy graphics. It's gonna be an easy little babby game. Well, babby game it is not. Oh, for fuck's sake, these yellow ball bastards. It seems like all I'm fucking with today is nuts and balls. But I'm not gonna make a witty comment like Mr. Nuts sucks my nuts or something like that because this game is okay. I don't hate it. Interesting note is that it got a sequel, but it was exclusive to the Amiga. This one had an overworld and a story. A story about chickens from outer space appearing in Thunder Force 3 ships. It's got an interesting little mechanic that if you get hit, your hit point leaves your body and you can try to pick it back up and get it back but i found it kind of detrimental in that you'll get hit and then try to chase your hit point down and then get hit some more it's not a bad game either in fact i think it's kind of good but i do hate that it's got up to jump all of those amiga and microcomputer games had that overall mr nuts doesn't suck nuts last game everybody and who boy it's water world remember water world neat either a crappy movie about water gets a game by a company called Ocean. What could possibly go ah. Boys get ready for pure disappointment, not from the game, but from me. It's okay. It's not the greatest game in the world. It's not the best thing or worst thing I've ever played. It's just okay. So what you do is you eliminate all the enemies on screen, then you dive down in the water to collect some treasure and you can collect as much or as little as you want there's really no penalty for that then you got to save the people being kidnapped by the smokers which are the bad guys in this movie the smokers are the bad guys what are you the surgeon general and then you got this side scrolling part where you got to kill all the enemies that are on the map and you know it works just fine the weapon works fine the controls work just fine it's fine there's nothing bad for me to say about it i'm really surprised you would have thought a game about water world wouldn't be no count but this is actually kind of count it's it's not great, but for an ocean game? This is competent. Water World gets a fucking pass, man. It's definitely better than the movie, and it makes me want to go fishing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all the ocean games I can stand. Oh, there's more. There's plenty more, but I left them out because, oh my god, they're just... Some of them are just boring to the point to where there's nothing to say about them, and some of them have been reviewed by better reviewers than me. So with that, we close the video. Now, if you liked this, and you like what I do, and want to support what I do, you can check me out on the Patreon. I've got a $1 tier and a $5 tier, and on that $5 tier, you get to see the videos before anybody else and join the Discord, too. I've also got a Redbubble merch store where you can buy a bunch of cool stuff. But that's gonna do it for now. My name's Stuart K. Riley, and I am out of here. Elden Ring is a shitty game. The ZX Spectrum was something I was always curious about because we didn't have it in the U.S., and I had no intentions of buying one myself. But every British gamer YouTuber always talked about it in some shape or form. Mostly it would be Guru Larry or Ashens that would talk about it, and I'm like, what is that? And it led me down this rabbit hole of 80s British games I've never heard of, which was one of the things that sparked me into reviewing so much Eurojank. And now it's just become one of those things that I do often. And still to this day, I'm like one of the only American YouTubers that has actually touched a ZX Spectrum game. With that in mind, here's the video.
Me and these games have a lot in common. We're both on the spectrum. So what in the hell is a ZX Spectrum? And yes, it is Z because it's British in it. The Spectrum was a budget computer by Sinclair released in 1982. Now in the early to mid 80s, the big main computers of the time were IBM PCs, Apple II, Atari 8-bit, and the Commodore 64. And in the USA, those were your main contenders. But in Europe, it was a whole different ball game. They had their own computers on top of those that we didn't get like the BBC Micro, the Amstrad, and of course the Spectrum. And yes, I know about the Timex Sinclair. Those barely made a dent in the US, so they don't count. The Spectrum was meant to be a budget-minded computer and costed way less than most other computers, including the C64, which was already cheaper than a PC or an Apple. How did they do this? Well, by cutting corners. The Spectrum had a lot less horsepower than its rivals using a simple color palette and what was basically simple beeps of audio, which to be fair, Apple and PC were still using at the time, while the C64 was melting our face with awesome SID chip tunes. The Spectrum would finally get a proper sound chip in an upgraded model, but what most people had was the bog standard little rubber keyboard box. Yeah, rubber keyboard. I bet that's about as fun to type on as those old VTech toy computers with the little membrane keys. In fact, Sinclair's previous computer, the ZX81, had that exact kind of keyboard. Yeah! Now, I wouldn't be talking about the Spectrum unless it had games, right? Well, the Spectrum had thousands of games, and the main way of playing them was on cassette tape, just like the C64. However, unlike the Commodore, you could use any old piece of shit cassette player that you had lying around to load the game. One less peripheral that you had to buy, and that's always nice. Could you imagine having to buy a proprietary cassette player just so you can listen to one specific album? I watch enough tech moan to know something like that probably exists. The good news about the tapes, though, is that instead of taking 20 whole fucking minutes to load like a C64, a Spectrum could do it in four minutes, which is about as fast as a C64 floppy disk. Man, loading games back then sounds like hell. Think about buying a game you've never played before and loading it up for 5 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, and after waiting all that time and finally playing the game, turns out the game sucks. Now you've wasted all that time loading a piece of shit game, and you're out 10 pounds or roughly $20 in 1980s money. But it's loaded now, so you might as well play the damn thing. Makes me think of my young self renting NES games and having a shitty game for the whole weekend. I played plenty of those LJN games. Man, movie games were such a scam. The Spectrum had plenty of those too, and it's a good way to start the review. Here's Robocop on the Spectrum. <laughs> Robocop on the Spectrum. It's like he's socially awkward and can't really talk to people, but he knows literally everything about Pokemon or something. See, I can make those jokes. I'm autistic. I know what it's like to be the sad man. Oh, for fuck's sake, it's that Dilbert song again. Ranch or coal ranch, creep. Serve the public trust. Protect the innocent. Now the first thing I noticed off the bat is, man, this game is stiff. And one could make the argument that he's a robot, so his movements are supposed to be stiff? Well, one could make the argument that you're a jackass. Overall, this game plays like if Contra was very slow. There's nothing really to the game. You just go to the right and shoot. And I think the trick is you need to duck and shoot every time. But the controls are so unresponsive, you'll be lucky if you can get Robocop to duck. Then you got these karate guys kicking you in the face and these chainsaw guys that take a million fucking hits. And by the time you get turned around to try to shoot them, they're already sawing into you. What's aggravating is the enemies walk the same speed as you, so you can't get away from them. If you can survive long enough, you'll get a new gun that kills everything in one hit and then hits whatever enemies are behind the enemy you shot at. But when you run out of ammo, it's right back to the regular gun. Ah, oh, crap. Two chainsaw man? Come on, guys. Leave me alone. Fuck! Well, shit. I cannot get very far in this game at all. This is the first fucking level, and I can't get halfway through it. And every time you die, it takes you right back to the start. Overall, I wouldn't buy this for a dollar. Not even 69 cents. Next, we've got Manic Miner. Okay, I can think of about 50 jokes I can make about the word miner, and 50 of them will get me in trouble. So instead, here's the best music you've ever heard in your life. Well, 
Well, it still sounds better than Pink Floyd. So in Manic Miner, you collect all the items on the screen and head to the goal. And you gotta do it before you run out of air or hit something. Hit what exactly? Weeds! You can die from touching grass. It sounds like half my fan base. And did you notice I died from touching a weed that was on a completely different platform? I just went through the platform and then hit the weed. That's good game design, man. And then there's this asshole over here who's going... Let me introduce you to a saying that I came up with specifically for British platformer games. Brits can't jump. British game developers in the 80s were physically and mentally unable to code a decent jump mechanic in a video game. They couldn't do it. It really wasn't until Super Mario Brothers came along that people realized you're supposed to have full T total control over the character while it's in midair, which is something none of these British platformers ever had. Also, there's fall damage. Fall damage in a platformer, that's great. I wouldn't give this game to somebody I hated. I give them retarded creatures and caverns. I bet you weren't expecting to hear that today. With his beloved ring now safely back in his possession, Bulbo vowed never again to pursue the art of boggling and turned to the gentler pursuit of reading the Goblin Gazette. It was while engaged in this activity that he first chanced upon the leaflet that would introduce him to the joys of RCNC. One day as Bulbo idly flicked between the page three elf and the sports results, he happened upon a small leaflet and now the start of something called retarded creatures and caverns now never being afraid to try something new he soon filled in the form and sent it off along with some of his precious gold to the address at the bottom of the leaflet two days later a small jiffy i'm not reading all this shit damn oh no is this a text adventure it is boo all right time to find out what works go to castle maybe later but not now open door easier said than done could you please give me one Straight answer? Go north. Algy couldn't find no way past the tightly closed door. Okay, open door. Oh, you mother. Something stirred in the depths of the moat. Look at moat. What the fuck? It took me back to the start. Okay, examine moat. Hey, now we're getting somewhere. Examine door? Use door. Ah! Jump in the moat. Easier said than done. Hit self. Fuck you! Algy didn't know how to! Get that retarded Dragoosey! Examine self! Algy saw nothing special. Oh! Algy's been taking that depression himself, eight. Examine castle. Built many years ago when the skies are full of dragons. It's twin towers stood proud and tall. Damn, dragons did 9-11. Go to castle. Enter castle. Open door. Go through the door. FBI, open up the damn door. Fuck. Algy didn't know how to. Well, that's a you problem. Well, that was Retarded Creatures and Caverns, everybody. What a great game. I'll give it a 3 out of 10. The Evil Dead. Okay, video games haven't been kind to the Evil Dead series. And this is no exception. It's a top-down game where you run around in the infamous cabin killing monsters. I guess that's supposed to be Bruce Campbell. And I guess this is a swing? Man, you really gotta use your imagination for these games. You run around in the cabin until your energy goes down, and once it does, you lose a life. Sometimes you pick up an item, and I have no idea what it does. Maybe it gives you a sense of accomplishment. There's other people running around in the cabin, and I have no idea what they're supposed to be. Maybe they're zombies or the doppelganger Bruce Campbell from the movie? But that'd be giving the game too much credit. Besides, that was Evil Dead 2. Also, this keeps happening. Whoa! Seizure warning! Get out your glow sticks, it's the evil rave. They really must just say about this game, you just run around, kill monsters, and that's it. It's weird to think that this game probably took months to develop back in the day, but somebody could make this in Game Maker Studio in a day. What's sad is Evil Dead would never get a decent video game. Every video game that ever had Evil Dead on it sucked. Maybe one day a game will come along to break that curse, but I ain't holding my breath. Okay, so here's a game called Elite, and it might be the most complex and confusing game I've ever played in my life. It's less a game, more of a spaceship simulator. It has an open world, tons of planets to go to, and I think you, like, buy supplies and then sell them to other planets for a profit. I think it's a money maker system you're supposed to work with. So textiles, I guess we'll get one. Radioactives, uh, one. 
Slaves? I guess the South won in the Space Civil War. And apparently a human being is worth as much as a textile. But hot damn, you know liquor's an arm and a leg. It costs more than the radioactives, dude. It costs less to build a nuclear bomb than it does to get hammered. Guys, if there's a game out there that makes me feel like a stupid person when I play it, it's Jeopardy and this game. I have no idea what's going on or what I'm doing. You know what's worse? I can't find a manual for this game. I found something, though. Apparently the game comes with an overlay which shows you what all the buttons do. And I did find this guide which was a little bit more helpful. And I was actually able to start flying. I still have no idea what I'm doing though. I'm basically driving blind right now. Maybe I'll find another ditch to flip upside down in. If you're wondering what all this stuff on the bottom is for, me too! So after a whole bunch of nothing happening, a couple of ships came at me and started shooting at me. Finally, something's happening. This firefight drew on for about five minutes or so. So, and then finally, I blew one of them up. And that's when I said, yeah, man, I'm good. I'm satisfied. I blew a ship up. I got my 10 pounds out of this game. Now, before you ask, does this game have anything to do with Elite Dangerous? Elite Dangerous is the sequel to this game. So this franchise still gets games, apparently. And you've been playing a franchise without even knowing it's a franchise. I guess the technology finally caught up with the concept. But I can't call this a bad game. Somebody who's got more patience than I do could probably get some fun out of this. Also, this game was made by a company called Firebird. Yeah, who's your competitor? Mustang Games? Me, I'm a Camaro gamer. Bomb Jack. Okay, this guy is the polar opposite to Bomberman. Instead of placing bombs, you're collecting bombs. And you gotta collect every bomb on the screen. Some of the bombs light their fuses, and when they do that, I don't know, Pac-Man shows his dick or something. What do you want from me? It's a game where you collect all the bombs on the screen. You expect me to know every little thing about every single game I play? Are you ever gonna to play this game? No, be honest. Are you ever going to play this game? No, you're not. Why? Because there's better games in the world. Yeah, I can see you in a Discord call. Oh yeah, what are you playing? Oh, I'm playing Call of Duty. What are you playing? Oh, I'm playing Forza Horizon. What about you, Billy? What are you playing? Uh, I'm playing Bomb Jack on the ZX Spectrum. One of your friends is gonna go, yo, man, you okay? That's my review of this game. If you play it, people will ask you if you're okay. Ant attack. You're in an isometric black and white world running away from giant ants. And sometimes you go behind walls and can't see where you're going. The controls are really weird. You had to push these very random buttons on the keyboard to turn yourself left or right, and then you had a separate button for going forward, making this one of the oldest games in the world to use tank controls. This is another one of those stupid games where the enemies go as fast as you do. You've got bombs you can throw at them, but you can accidentally blow yourself up with them. Speaking of turning, the graphics are so primitive it's hard for me to tell which way I'm facing. So I think you're supposed to find the other people in the maze and rescue them, but I have never found one single person. Found plenty of ants, though. I did shoot two ants at one time, and it made me feel pretty good about myself. I've heard some people say that this was their favorite Spectrum game, and all I gotta say is Stockholm Syndrome is real. If you've got nothing else to compare this against, I mean, yeah, I guess. I don't know what you're gonna say, Stu. You were a 90s kid. These games are too old for you. Bruh, I had a 2600 and an NES as a kid. And I gotta say, I would play Pitfall a million million times before I'd play this shit. I legit feel bad for British people. Maybe that's why they're so mean. They grew up with games like this. Anyway, we still got plenty to go, so let's move on. Now, I can't make a Spectrum video without playing Jetpack. It's the law. Now, anybody that's played Donkey Kong 64 will immediately recognize this game, because this is a rare game. Back when they were called Ultimate Play the Game, they released several games on the Spectrum, some of which people consider to be the best games on the system. This one being included. And you know what? I hated this game on DK64. I don't hate it now. In fact, after all of the crap that I've played, I would say this is the best game I played for this video. I thoroughly enjoyed Jetpack. It's a simple, easy to get into game. You collect ship parts, then you fill the ship with fuel, you get in the ship, and blast off. Now, do it a million times. Let's look at another rare game, A Tick Attack. Night Wizard Surf. What the hell's a surf? Isn't that like a politics? thing? Or am I thinking of turf? Is it surf and turf? Whatever, I don't watch the news. Though I was a newsman in the past life. So a tick attack could probably be called a dungeon crawler because you run around all these little rooms looking for keys and there's like secret pathways and alternate routes and stuff. So most of this game will be spent trying to figure out where the hell you're supposed to go. But that's kind of the point. You're supposed
supposed to try to figure out where the hell you're supposed to go. The whole point of the game is exploring. One thing I thought was weird, now all the doors take keys except for the white ones. The white ones will open up by themselves, but they kind of open when they want to. So you got to sit there and wait for them to open up. What is this? This is a vault? It's Vault 1884. I didn't know they went that high. I didn't get very far in this game, but I feel like if I sat down and took some time with it, I could probably play this game to completion. I kind of want to play it on my own time. I think it's got potential. I didn't hate it. Good job, Rare. You're two for two. But here's where they let me down. Underworld, which unfortunately has nothing to do with Kate Beckinsale. Sad. Underworld is a British platformer and it plays like a British platformer. <laughs> It may have the worst jump mechanic I've ever seen in a game in my life. Your jump is this long horizontal shit that you have absolutely no control over, and you keep bouncing against the enemies and they knock you all over the place. If you hit a wall, you ricochet back. If you hit an enemy, you ricochet hickashay. You just find yourself going out of control 99% of the time you play this game. I don't even know where I'm supposed to go. No matter where I go, I keep ending up in this hole. And then I need to get on these bubbles to make my way back up but i can't jump on them because i have no control over my jump and these motherfuckers keep knocking me all over the place ah this sucks 31 flavors of ass butterscotch butter pecan chocolate you name it no matter what i did in this game i kept ending up in this damn hole this game is just plain awful it's like rare had one or two good developers and then they had one or two bad developers and then they made this game it's hard to believe they went from this to donkey kong country but at least we can say they greatly improved from this. They do these bad Spectrum games, they do bad LJN games, and then Nintendo says, hey, you want to make a Donkey Kong game for us? And they're like, Bob's your uncle, we'll make it right pretty, we will. And then suddenly they shit out Picassos, and my trope about British games being bad goes null and void. I don't know, man, but I'm thankful for every game that they put out after these. You notice how I'm still stuck in this hole? I wanted you to see how long I played this before I figured out you you can't get out of here because the jump mechanics are so bad you're just stuck. Oh well, two out of three ain't bad. This is the last rare game I played, Night Lore. This is an isometric adventure game, and this game apparently did so well back in the day that Rare reused the engine of this game to make other games. Notice how I'm kind of wandering around? You know what I'm doing? I just realized you turn left and right to turn yourself around, you press up to move forward. I don't know why they couldn't have just made it you go the direction you move the joystick, but to be fair, isometric games was a new idea. Holy shit, I turned into a furry. Yeah, your character apparently becomes a werewolf at night, as shown by the moon in the corner. I don't know what that changes, but okay. Oh, I found the vaporwave room. There's rooms in this game where you can't walk on half of the room? There's an invisible wall stopping me here. You think I could walk all the way there to that corner, but I can't. And the jumping, once again, Brits can't jump. When you jump forward, you jump forward a set amount, and you end up overshooting what you're trying to jump on top of. Wait, wait a minute, did you hear something? What the? I guess that got in the recording. Wow, I bet that confused the hell out of you. You checked it, didn't you? I don't know. I feel like this is another one. If I had infinite time to spend just sitting here playing it, I could probably progress in it pretty far and maybe end up liking it. But I just got other games I want to play more, you know? And this is probably the last time I'll ever play this game, to be honest with you. But I can see how people would have thought this game was good back in the day. Jet Set Fucking Willy has nothing to do with Jet Set Radio. It's just a weird coincidence. And it's a sequel to Manic Miner. And I already told you how much I love that game. This is the same game, but just now instead of a bunch of levels, it's one big level. Just what I wanted, a game I don't like made longer. I couldn't get very far in this game because I can't get past this one particular spot. There's this real precision jumping you have to do, and you don't need me to tell you you can't do it. Why? Brits, Brits can't jump. jump! The jumping is terrible and clunky in this game too, just like every other game we've played. But at least I got to see the nightmare room where you turn into a pig with wings and you get attacked by flying mother-in-laws and the foot from Monty Python. Other than that, it's Manic Miner just worse. Next is- What? 
The Duke's a Hazard? Well, where was this game when I made my video on that? Oh, I remember this game. It was on the Commodore 64 as well. This is the one that has the FBI helicopter shooting missiles at you. Also, Rob Zombie's Dragula is in here for some reason. Crash on the Duke, boys, and fuck Daisy Duke in the ass in the back of my jugular. Jugular? The steering is very unresponsive in this game. I can't get the general to switch lanes for shit. I'm gonna go back to what I said in the first review of this game. What did the Duke boys do that the FBI is trying to murder them? Maybe they found a renewable source of energy in moonshine and the FBI is gonna kill them for it. That was actually a real episode. Hey, there's Roscoe. Oh, I'm gonna get you boys. Go, 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 go. What even is this review at this point? Let's move on. I already played this game anyway. Dizzy, the ultimate cartoon adventure. Codemasters. Oh, they make a lot of good racing games. Oh boy, another platformer. Yippee. I know you're tired of hearing me say jump, but jump. Yeah, jump. It's awful. He like does this flip in the air. And again, it's impossible to land exactly where you want to land. Also, I love this sign that used to say danger and now it says dang. Well, we're not going that way. Let's go the other way. Huh? Yeah, I've been playing these games too long. I'm taking a nap after this fucking video. Anyway, not much happens in this game. You get harassed by spiders. You pick up a bunch of weird items that don't do anything. And you could get killed by raindrops. What is it? Acid rain? Damn, I feel like I made that joke before. I'm running out of fresh stuff. Okay, we'll say it's the tears of everybody who played this game. I don't know, maybe you get an umbrella or something later on and you can walk through it, I don't know. My whole opinion of this game is don't know, don't care. By the time I got to this game, I was done and was ready for this shit to be over, like now. Dream Warrior, oh, that gives me an excuse to play this. So in Dream Warrior, you're Master Chief shooting little aliens, as Master Chief does. So you walk around with a weird perspective, you shoot aliens, you're not quite sure you're hitting them, you're not quite sure where you're supposed to stand when you hit them, or shoot at them, whatever, and you run out of places to go extremely quick. And that's where you get to the point where you're going, okay game, what stupid bullshit do I have to do to progress? Well first of all, this big blue thing in the middle is a door, it don't look like a door, but it is a door. So we can make a little bit of progress. I don't know if this shit on the ground is landmines or items or what it is. One thing I do know is the screen tearing is having a field day with this game. But yeah, you got doors, but you don't know which one of these fucking walls here is an actual door. Isn't this a beautiful color palette? Blue, blue, and more blue. I'm gonna be completely honest, I have no idea. Oh, the game's over. Okay. I'm Stu, that's me. I ain't much for Dream War. Warrior, but maybe tonight it'll be gone. Rainbow Islands, the story of Bubble Bobble 2. Let me explain this game. So, you play as the Bubble Bobble characters, but in human form. It's them, but they're human. So... Okay? And you don't blow bubbles, you throw rainbows. Rainbows that you can now jump on top of or walk on top of. These guys are pissing rainbows and shitting sunshine. One trick I was real proud of myself for doing is while you're jumping up and forward, place the rainbow while you're jumping and you'll automatically walk on top of it. And you can keep placing rainbows while you're moving up and like infinitely scroll up. Pretty cool, but pretty reckless. You can get hit easily like that. This game wasn't too bad, actually. I found myself having a good time with this game. Until I got to the first level boss and I never really was able to beat him. I guess my gamer skills ain't perfect. Other than that, not much to say. It's a pretty straightforward arcade game and I like it. Let me ask you something. Are you wearing headphones right now? <laughs> Oh my god, I hate this game already. Oh, and it's a Beam software game. Their games suck. They did many of those shitty Tom and Jerry games I reviewed, as well as those crappy Back to the Future games. And this one, Horace Goes Skiing. Well, before Horace goes skiing, he has to go get some skis. But before he gets some skis, he's gotta cross the road. So this is basically a combination of Frogger and Ski Free. Shout out to all the 30-year-old boomers who remember Ski Free. And as you can see, I don't know how to play this game. I'm supposed to get in between the flags. It's really hard to turn though. You got a steady momentum that takes you down. I love the noise the game makes when you hit a tree. Ah, my ear canals have been cleansed. Well, when you get to the bottom of the slope, you gotta play the Frogger game again. Your money is considered your lives in this game, and when you run out of money, you can't buy any more skis. 
You can also lose money by getting hit by cars. It's kind of a silly game, and I don't hate it. I appreciate what it's trying to do. And this was apparently a very early Spectrum game. I actually heard that there was a YouTuber who used to use this character in their videos, and the copyright holder of the character Horus had a bunch of their videos taken down. What a bunch of assholes. I hated Beam Software before. I certainly do now. Guys, that would be like, like back in my YouTube poop days. Eric Schwartz taking down my video because I use the Sabrina animations a whole bunch. Of course, since I don't make any money on those videos, I think it'd be funny as hell. But I digress. I hope that YouTuber recovered from that. As for Horace, he could go eat a Horace cock. Last game. Uh, this one was weird. So weird, in fact, I couldn't figure out how to play it. But it was too weird not to show. This is a game called Back to School. <laughs> Lovely. From what I've been told about this game, it's a school simulator. To that I must ask the question, why? Is it the point of video games to get your mind off of school and education? But apparently this is bully before bully was a thing. Basically all you do is walk around school and the fucking- Oh! Ah! Oh my ears! Why does it do that? Nobody wants to hear that shit! But yeah, every time the teachers find you doing something and you're not supposed to, they make you write lines. So when you come home from school from having to write lines a thousand times, you can do it at home. I never understood the whole lines thing myself. If you did have to write a thousand lines, let's say, if you had to do that while everybody else is trying to learn, well, you're gonna miss out on all the schoolwork that you were supposed to be doing, so you're not gonna know anything for the tests or anything like that. So isn't that the teacher's fault for making you having to do something something else while everybody else is learning? At that point, the parents shouldn't be mad at you. They should be mad at the teacher for your- Ah! Okay! Okay! Ah, can't get a word in. Was this game meant to be as annoying and unfun as possible? If so, then it's the perfect school simulator. Now you just have to have that one creepy kid in your class that smokes cigarettes and talks about knives all day. Did y'all have one of those? I certainly did. Now he's 30 and has a mohawk and gets high all the time. Last time I saw him, I was at a gun store. Store. He was trying to sell a gun that still had all the brand new tags on it. After the store owner told him no, he tried to sell it to me. I said, bro, I don't want any gun that's got your fingerprints on it. Man, the people that live in my neighborhood. I've got one more game to show you. I know, I lied. I told you that was the last one. Well, no, this is the last one. And it's both surprising and non-surprising what it is. Doom! It's Doom on the Spectrum! Will you take a look at this? I mean, you could kind of tell how they pulled it off. But the unfortunate thing is it's only one level and there's no enemies. But the very fact that this exists is something else. I can't imagine what all kind of crazy tricks they had to pull to make this game work. And I thought it was a perfect way to end the video. But there you go, Spectra Doom. And with that, our ZX Spectrum adventure comes to a close. We had some good times, we had some bad times, we had some times I wish I would have never made this video. But we got through it together and that's what's important. Unless you clicked off halfway through like a lot of you do i see you you have blonde hair you have funky looking glasses they don't quite fit your head but your mama tells you you're handsome because she wants her son to believe that your mama's a good person you know you should talk to her more where am I going with this? Let's get out of here, bye. Amiga games. I had always planned to review Amiga games at some point because Eric Schwartz had planted the seed for what kind of furries I would be interested in throughout my lifetime. And yes, that's why Sabrina is on the thumbnail. Even with what little video I did, there's still tons of Amiga games I could do videos on, enough to where I could make several parts. So it might be possible I might do another Amiga video if I have nothing else to do. All right, boys, this has been a long time coming. We're gonna talk about Amiga games. Now what the hell is an Amiga? Short answer, a short-lived computer from the 80s. Long answer, <gasps> The Amiga was Commodore's attempt at making the most powerful computer ever made. It could do better the graphics, better sound, and was faster than its rivals. The Mac, Atari ST, Commodore's own 64, and even the early PCs at the time. Okay, I'll stop now. They launched it around 1985, and for years, they sold less than the amount of words that were in Kiefer Sutherland's MGS5 script. Why? Because they marketed it like crap with those weird commercials that made no sense. Oh, wow, this computer has a funky fetus. Take all my money and fuck me dry. They would, too. They were $1,300 at launch. That's over $3,300 
hundred dollars in 2021 money or 2.61080 ti as of this recording when it first came out there was hardly any software or games available for it because nobody freaking cared about this thing it was expensive everything was proprietary to it the only thing the first amiga had going for it was hey the two games for it are pretty and it can ray trace 1985 ray tracing my gpu from 2012 can't do ray tracing it don't do nothing but spin its little fans the little bitch i'm sorry i'm sorry in 1987 amiga released the 500 the much better way cheaper version of the old amiga and guess what it actually sold a few hundred thousand and there was tons of software it had a video editor called video toaster please somebody make a youtube poop with it the 500 was a big upgrade from the old c64 hell it made it look like a kid's toy it had a way faster floppy drive built into it and the os had an actual gui with windows and icons and everything you know like a computer holy crap and instead of a built-in synthesizer like the c64 the amiga used audio samples like a super nintendo so you can make your instruments any Anything you wanted, like farts. Of course, if you really want fart music, you could just listen to a Sega Genesis. Anyway, when the 500 came out, that's when the games started pouring in. There were so many games made for the Amiga, no one has a real official number. Wikipedia says 2198, but the real number could be somewhere near 5,000. I could dedicate the rest of my life to reviewing Amiga games and still never review them all. So here's just a few I gathered up that I thought look interesting and some that are considered the best Amiga has to offer. God, I hope these games don't suck as bad as the C64 one. The first one we're gonna look at is called Savage. Savage! 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 Oh, that music is so cheesy. I love it. So it's a platformer, and you throw an unlimited amount of axes at your enemies. And the thing I noticed right off the bat is the enemies respawn a lot, and there's tons of them. And the arc on your weapon seems to go over them a lot, so you keep having to duck down just to hit them. Oh, check out this guy. He's just one static sprite jumping up and down. The first part of the stage is pretty easy. It's the second part where they actually start throwing shit at you. You got rocks falling down, you got Donkey Kong barrels, and you still got your standard enemies. The enemies aren't really what kills me because the game gives out a bunch of life potions. It's this particular spot right here that I can't seem to get past. What's bad is there's enemies spawning the whole time you're trying to do this very careful platforming. So you just gotta pretty much take the hits while you're doing it because you really need to concentrate. It sucks because I really wanted to like this game because I like the music. But I wouldn't say the game is bad. It's just hard. Surf Ninjas. That is a name and that is a title screen. This can't be genuine. It's gotta be a joke. This looks like one of those PS1 texture games you'd see on Itch.io. Well, it gives what it promises. There's the surf and there's the ninja. So this is either a beat-em-up or a ballet dancing simulator. One of the two. Look how graceful this jump kick is. Yeah, trample him. Kick him while he's down. I need to wax the board. Is that what they're calling it now? What the fuck? What is he even doing? Oh, for fuck's sake, I cannot hit anybody with this stick for some reason. For real, the whole time I had this weapon, I did not hit anybody, not once. Holy fuck, I ripped his guts out. And he gets back up like nothing happened. Wow. Don't fuck with a surf ninja. This one's still my favorite. I just love that noise. Oh, if you hold the button down, you can just keep doing it. Yeah, he ain't walking that off, but the guy getting his spleen ripped out, nah, that's fine. Have you noticed I haven't really told you what you're supposed to do in this game? Because I don't know. I think you're supposed to give the items on the ground to a couple of different people, but I haven't figured out who to give them to. But it's okay, because this is considered one of the shittiest games on the Amiga, and... I can see that. Next. Now, I can't make a video about the Amiga without talking about Shadow of the Beast. This was a visually impressive game back in the day. This game was straight up doing things that hadn't been done yet, like parallax scrolling, and honestly looks like a Super Nintendo game, even though the SNES was still a year away. This game coming out in 89, and the SNES coming out in 1990. But is this game any good? Well, for one thing, your character is a boulder-punching asshole. You get one life, no continues and the whole game is open for you to explore with no clues on where you're supposed to go. It's like doing surgery blindfolded while high. This hit detection is completely unfair. I have to get right up to this grasshopper thing before I can hit him and he hits me first. And how many of 
them do you need? Oh my god. This enemy has a lot of frames of animation before it swings its sword, so the idea is you punch him before he swings. Thing is, you have to know how close you have to be before you can do that. Wouldn't be so bad if his arms weren't so short he has to jack off hands free. So according to the walkthrough, I have to get this blue orb thing, and the way you get it is you crouch down, wait until the fire goes out, and punch it. You only have just enough time to punch it once every time it spits the fire, so you're gonna have to crouch, punch, crouch, punch. Damn, this game is more tedious than having to find a place to bury your neighbor's dog after you shot it for tearing up your mail, some bitch. Then you have to beat this boss that rocks back and forth, but it seems like your punches don't do anything, and if it touches you, instant deaths start the whole game over. Well, guess what? That orb we picked up earlier, that's a power-up, but it only works if you have full health. But now the boss is easier to kill. But guess what? Once you beat him, it takes the power-up away from you. Why? God forbid I have something in this game that makes it a little easier. I already had to put an infinite life cheat code in, and boy did I need it. Look at this. Look at how many enemies there are. Look at this shit. And now there's spikes coming out of the ceiling. They expect you to beat this game in one life? Who made this game? Reflections? You mean like Driver? Actually, that explains a lot. Driver 1 and 2 are balls hard. The people behind Driver made an impossible to beat platformer. That makes a lot of sense. Anyway, typical torture simulator. Let's move on. This one is called Space Hulk, and it's a mech shooter where you control five different mechs at once. Why? I don't know. It's like they had the idea to make it multiplayer and change their mind or something. Anyway, ain't much to say. You shoot the monsters and head to the goal, and the monsters seem to one-hit kill you, so that might be why they give you multiple mechs. Why not just give me one mech with hit points? That's like if you had control of every life you had in Mario at once instead of just having the live system. Why even do this? The mechs are all the same, they shoot the same, they work the same, everything. I don't get it, Big Dan. Cannon fodder, and I already like this one because it has a theme song. Now, Cannon Fodder is a top-down shooter with mouse aiming, and the game gives you different missions to complete, ranging from kill this to blow up that. You can control all your soldiers at once or split them into teams. Instead of lives, you get a bunch of soldiers, and every time you lose some soldiers, their graves pop up on this hill. It does make you wonder just how many graves can be put on this hill. And would you believe it, you can actually save your game in this one. Something we take for granted now, but was very rare back then. What's really funny about this game is how many times you could shoot people after they've already died. Wait, what? What happened? Apparently a piece of debris from that building shot up and exploded in front of my soldiers. I just happened to be standing in just the correct place. Uh, this one's okay, I guess. Uh, I ain't really got nothing funny to say about it other than, well, it's still better than anything the Army Men series ever put out. That might be foreshadowing, by the way. Sensible soccer. Now, what's so sensible about soccer? Excuse me for not knowing my geography, but what is this flag? Damn, it sure gives you a lot of teams to choose from. The gang's all here, boys. Let's do the little Norwegians versus Berkele. Ooh, this is a sports game, all right. I already don't know what I'm doing or which one of these characters I am. Which one of these is Norway? Well, he's gonna kick it in, but wait. Oh no, here it comes. It's going the other way. It's, he's gonna hit it in the- no! Choose a team to edit. Wait, hold the fuck up. You can make your own custom teams? No, don't give me this power. Let's see. I'm running out of names here. Uh, Genius Kajumbo. Norman Reedus. Funky Fetus. Oh, uh, what's the Snatcher guy's name? Uh, oh, fuck it. John Snatcher. Master Miller and, uh... David Bowie. All right, Team Foxhound, baby. Let's see, we're working, man. Who should I put? Oh, I could put my patrons. Oh, I wish I could fit all of you. I love you guys. And Bustin, 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 Bustin. Oh, God, I'm having more fun with this than I am with the game. Let's make a furry team. A first response. <laughs> 
Dixits. You know, I have to shoehorn Dixie in there somewhere. So let's see, Doug Winger. Yeah, Google that if you want to go on an adventure. Tech Works, he needs in there too. Bugs Bunny in drag. <laughs> and I'm satisfied. Before I was done, I had made a Mogus and Deltarune too. I did find out how to play the game. It turns out I had to set the team to player. So my goof. Deltarune versus Amogus, the match of the century. Spammed it as 700 Chromer betting on Amogus losing. So back to the game, the player character you control depends on who's closest to the ball from what I can tell. Pretty simple game. You use the button to kick, you use the stick to move. And that AI is pretty damn unforgiving too. Toby Fox is handing me my ass on a plate. Even though I know nothing about soccer, I learned how to play it pretty damn quick. And you know, for a sports game, it's not that bad. I could see somebody who's into soccer spending a lot of time on this game. This actually makes me want to try Mario Strikers. Super Frog. Okay, I have to mention this one. Because look at this intro and tell me if you recognize this animation. Super Frog. This intro was made by none other than Eric Schwartz himself, the guy behind those really horny Amiga animations, including those Sabrina ones I used to spam in my old YouTube poops. We've come full circle, boys. Oh look, his feet do that spinning thing. And one of the enemies kinda resembles a hedgehog. Now all it needs is a poorly made HD remake with terrible reviews. Ooh. Oh. Yep, that's a mascot platformer, all right. It's a shame because this game doesn't seem that bad. You can jump on enemies, you can shoot enemies, you can find hidden secrets, collect coins, and get to the goal. The maps aren't too awful confusing, and the graphics and music are pretty decent for 93. But by 1993, the Amiga was already dead, and the PC had won the computer war. Luckily, this did get converted to MS-DOS in 94, and then later got a GOG release on Windows. Unfortunately, when the HD version got reviewed, bombed, the developers removed it and the original version from GOG. Assholes. By the way, these are the same people that published Ukulele. Take that how you will. Damn, the story of this game's more interesting than the game itself. It's just a simple mascot platformer. Thank God there weren't no more of the- Oh, damn. There is no mascot, only Zool. Oh! Oh, oh, that is ugly. Oh my God. This is the ugliest game I've ever seen. Look at how busy this is. And what is that noise? Yeah, great soundtrack, bro. You know, when my dad used to hear somebody complain, he would say, I would rather listen to a frog fart in a glass. I think this is what it would sound like. I mean, to be fair, the game runs fine and it plays okay. It's just not fun to look at. You know when somebody's really ugly, but they're a really nice and friendly person, so you really don't have anything bad to say about them? This is that. I can't even bring myself to enjoy the game because it just, it hurts my eyes to look at. If they didn't do nothing but get rid of the shit in the background, it would look a little better. This is like what happens when a wannabe graphic designer gets their first clip art CD. Use all the PS. PNGs. It actually hurts the gameplay because I can't see some of the enemies. There's one down here that shoots projectiles and I can't see them through the sea of bullshit in the background. Oh fuck! For a minute I thought he was laying on the floor bleeding out, but no, he's just jumping. One more thing before we leave this game, Zool looks like a gimp. Now here's a story I want to bring up. In the 90s, after the Amiga started getting old, several Amiga games ended up getting ported to the Sega Genesis. Sega welcomed Amiga devs with open arms, and EA, who had a strong relationship with Sega at the time, helped port many Amiga games to the Genesis. Trip Hawkins, the founder of EA, who we talked about in the Army Men review, you probably wanted to see all these small computer game devs get more exposure from the console market as he was big into the small underdog dev teams. You'll know an EA published game from that yellow tab on the cart. Well, one of those games was Lotus 2 Rex, which I had as a kid. I wouldn't find out till many years later that this game was Lotus 3, the ultimate challenge on the Amiga. And I have to say, after playing both versions, the Genesis is a near perfect port, although the music isn't near as good. I mean, damn, listen to the Amiga music. As 
you can see, this game is very much in the style of OutRun or Pole Position. You can do an arcade-style race against the timer, or you can do a championship and try to get in first place. It gives you a lot of different environments to race through and a plethora of different tracks. What's special about this game is every single track you play on is different. The game has a proprietary track generator called the Rex System, and you can even use it to make your own tracks. And you get a password with each one you make so you can save your tracks. This was pretty ambitious for the time. The Genesis version had the Rex System too, and I remember having lots of fun generating tracks. I have always appreciated the pseudo 3D effect in this game, and other games like it. These are some of my favorite 2D racing games. Mario Kart and F-Zero can suck it. If this game was meant to sell more Lotus cars, it's working on me. When I win the lottery, first thing I'm gonna do is buy a Lotus and get a million speeding tickets from listening to these sick Amiga beats. Star Glider 2 by Argonaut Software, the same people that made the Super FX chip for Star Fox. Oh, this is... Oh, this, this is like if Star Fox was bad. Guys, I have no clue what I'm doing. This must be one of those games where if you don't have the manual, you can't play the game. Because what is this? What is that? What is anything? My God. Oh, hey, I blew something up. We're halfway there. Funny red guy. I want the funny red guy. What happens if I go up? Like way, way up. Oh, okay. The frame rate gets better. This game is uh, heavily optimized for Amiga hardware. I joke, but they actually did make GPUs for the Amiga. And you can still buy some of them brand new and nobody is scalping them. I mean, how much Ethereum are you going to mine with a 50 megahertz GPU? You'd be wasting more on your electric bill than you made. Oh, I forgot we had a game play in here. Uh, game sucks. Let's move on. Virus. Okay. Okay, you guys have to see what this game looked like in my folder. Yeah, that don't look suspicious at all. Ah, not another one of these. I spent most of my gameplay trying to figure out how you control the ship. You're not gonna believe what the controls are. You use the slash key to actually move the ship, and A and Z controls how fast you go in that direction. And then you use greater than and less than to go left or right. You know what? I've got a better control scheme. It's called the arrow keys. W A S. SD wasn't invented yet, but dude, the arrow keys were right there. I haven't even talked about the game. I mean, look at it. Unity Asset Slender Games ain't this dark. How are you supposed to know where you're even going? It's like driving with no headlights. I would know I've done it and I only wrecked once. I haven't even figured out what I'm supposed to do and at this point, I don't care. But I can say I downloaded a virus for this video. Hunter by Activision. Oh boy, there's a company that went down the shitter. You must collect one general General's head. Holy shit. What if I just give you the whole general and you cut the head off? I don't feel like getting my hands bloody. Oh, mama, it's another one of these. Might be the ugliest one yet. Yeah, I'm totally seeing what those groundbreaking Amiga graphics were all about. Okay, I have no idea what to do. I feel like I pressed every button on the keyboard. Ooh, ooh, I did something. Ooh, I did a different thing. What did that do? I, oh, I mean, uh, uh oh, okay. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, freaking, yeah. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, I'm good. Turrican. Okay, this title screen is awesome, but it's missing something. There we go. Ah, hit me with that good music again. Turrican is what happens when somebody says, okay, what if we take all these cool weapons that would work perfectly in a space shooter, but put them in a platformer? That's John Turrican. There's several different guns and they can be upgraded by getting power-ups. You need them though, because this game is balls hard. It's one of those games like Mega Man where it gives you a whole bunch of health, but you need it because you're going to get hit constantly. And you don't have any post-hit invincibility, so one enemy can just completely drain you. The game gives you like this wand of death that's really cool. You can just stand in one spot and eviscerate everything around you. The one thing that makes this game hard to love though is the maps are poo-poo. There's this one spot at this waterfall where you can get stuck at and you can't jump on the other platforms because the platform is just right to be wrong. It's too high to jump on, it's too low to jump to the platform beside it because you hit your head on it, and you can't jump to the platform on the left because there's a rock in the way. All you can do is run out your lives. And then there's these platforms that are stacked right on top of each other so it's hard to jump on them. Whoever made this part, you can fuck off right to hell. I've actually run my lives out on this one spot because of these stupid cannonballs. And it sucks because I really want to 
to like this game. In fact, I like this game so much, I tried the sequel. And you know what? Yeah, it's a little better, but it's still incredibly difficult. In between the fucking mosquitoes, these little green sons of bitches, and this one boss that takes a bazillion hits. I just found it really hard to get into this game. And yeah, there's probably somebody that can speed run this without losing a life. But your gamer dick is way bigger than mine, boy. If you want to try this game out for yourself, it was actually released on Genesis and Super Nintendo. And it first came out on the C64. Not that you want to play that version. So it was released on a ton of systems and I thought it was an Amiga exclusive and that's why I played it. And I just wasted my time. I'm very pissed right now. Now Worms is one of those games that a lot of people already know, but you may not know it got its start on the Amiga. It wouldn't be until Worms Armageddon that it got super popular. But if you've never seen Worms before, it's a turn-based combat game where a team of worms try to blow up another team of worms. And you get tons of cool weapons to do it with, including airstrikes where you can carpet bomb the shit out of them worms. Worms is pretty damn fun. You ought to look into getting Worms WMD, which is the newest one. The developers have damn near every Worms game on Steam. So go buy the shit instead of fucking with this Amiga crap. Oh no, Street Fighter on the Amiga. Huh. Well, the frame rate is garbage, but otherwise it's Street Fighter, all right? Oh man, I am no good at these games. I'm the worst person to be showing this off. Shit, I know none of the moves. I'm just fucking tapping buttons. Oh, oh, I did something. I get up. Oh wait, wait a minute. Uh, the punch? I, I won? Holy shit! I want to at least do a Hadouken. Let's see, how you do that? How do you do that? Uh, oh, here we go. Come at me, bro. Aha, gotcha. Guys, I am not good at these games. I don't know what I'm doing. Come on, Ken. Whip my ass. I've got other games to play. Oh, who's this guy? Blanca. That's a stupid name. Of course, he probably thinks Stu is a stupid name. I probably look like a total idiot right now. What the fuck? Are you serious? Okay, either the game is insanely easy, or just all of a sudden I'm good at Street Fighter or some shit. I'm, I'm up to M. Bison. Got... Guys, am I about to beat Street Fighter on the fucking Amiga? No fucking way! Why don't you try it on one of the harder le- Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. I was thinking, hell, the Street Fighter ain't this easy. Like, I was just mashing buttons. Well, I guess I can say that I beat Street Fighter 2. I don't know how, and I probably couldn't do it again. I think that's a good place to end the video. You know, there's still a lot of Amiga games out there, some that really needed to be reviewed, but I can only do so many in one video. So if you guys like this, we'll come back to it one day, because I could literally do the rest of my career just doing Amiga games. We will not run out, but I'm out of gas for this run, so I'm gonna cut it right here. Alright, you know what to do. Like, comment, sub, blah, 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 blah. Join my Patreon if you really want to support me, and I'll send you my videos before anyone else sees them. I put your name on the board, and you can hang out in the Patron Discord. If it were any more chill, it'd be full of ice cubes. If you want just your name on the board, you can do that for one damn dollar. One damn dollar keeps my lights on and my debtors away, or else they break my arms. Don't let them break my arms. Bye. The Commodore 64 video is one one of the longest videos I've ever made for this channel. And it didn't really do very well, it only started getting up in views recently. But it was my first serious look into Eurojank, and it's the video that started me going on this adventure of looking at shitty British games from the 80s, and now it's a staple on the show. And it all started here. Guys, this might be the episode that breaks me. In between computer issues, emulation issues, technical issues, and tennis shoes, I was so close to just pulling the plug on this episode and not having an episode this month. And I know I don't have that big of a following, there's not that many people that's gonna be upset, but I'll be upset. I can't do that to y'all. And in case you've never watched this before, my name's Stuart K. Riley. If you've never heard of me, I'm Stuart K. Riley, and this is Working Man Games. Hello! Okay, kids. First off, the Commodore 64 has nothing to do with the Nintendo 64. Erase that from your head. Now then, the C64 was a budget price computer made in 1982 that competed with the other 8-bit computers at the time. To put it in perspective, a PC running DOS was $1,300 in 80s money, and so was 
was an Apple II, but you could get a Commodore 64 for $600, and the older the C64 got, the more the price went down. So you could see why people would buy it over other platforms. Now, Atari, which started feeling the sting from the video game crash a year later, had the 400 and the 800, which were priced similar to the C64 and were basically a 5200 with a keyboard. And that was basically Commodore's only real competitor. Well, except for the Coleco Atom and the Mattel Aquarius and the Tandy and the Timex Sinclair and the... and the... The C64 spent a lot more time as an actual computer and as an educational teaching tool in the U.S. In fact, my personal C64 actually has a tag from the school that bought it. But in the U.K., it was a serious and inexpensive game console. In the late 80s, when the Sega Master System and the NES had arrived on the scene, consoles costed as much or more than a computer. In fact, if you look at this sales brochure, there were several computers that costed less or as much as an NES. And came with some games. And of the many computers you had to choose from in Europe, one of them was the C64. So there are lots of people who grew up with the C64 as their main game system. Never touched an NES, Atari, Sega, nothing. So as you can imagine, lots of people are nostalgic over this thing. Well, I'm not. I had a 2600 and an NES as my first console and had several mainstream consoles since. I didn't even grow up with PC games because by the time I got my first PC, I was too busy with my PlayStation. And I didn't have any internet at all to download games off of. So, I'm a Southern American who grew up on consoles and had actually never heard of the Commodore 64 until I was older. I'm an outsider looking in, a fresh face. And the reason I tell you all of that is because I'm about to look at the games the C64 has to offer and see how it holds up as a retro game system today as someone who has no nostalgia for it. I couldn't care if it shat or went blind. Now, with all that backstory out of the way that you you most likely skipped through because I bored you to death. Let's play the Commodore 64. Now, playing games on the C64 is easier said than done. There was a couple of different ways to play games. There were cartridges, which in my opinion were the best method because you pop it in, you turn it on, and you play. But they were expensive and expensive to make too. So what most people had in the US at least were floppy disks. And guys, let it be known. Let the word go forth to every person on the US universe that these are the slowest fucking floppy disks in all creation. This computer may very well hold the world record for the slowest loading games in existence. My God! Even when I unlocked the frame rate on the emulator, it still took forever to load. And by the time it finally fucking loads, you may find yourself playing the shittiest version of Street Fighter you've ever seen. Yeah, wait till you see how you do combos on this crap. But you know what? That's nothing. It gets worse. Floppies are actually one of the better choices of media to play your games on because there's a third option. And that option is, hold on to something for this, a cassette tape. Yes, the same kind of cassette tape your mother listens to the Moody Blues on. Don't listen to the Moody Blues. Listen to Saxon. You pop this cassette tape into this proprietary tape deck that half the time doesn't even work right, type a command on the computer, and then press play and wait how long you ask are you sitting down for this 20 motherfucking minutes i'm not making this up i've downloaded installed and started playing some games in less than 20 minutes on a one megabit per second connection because starlink still isn't here yet and i'm pretty pissed about that can't you tell 20 damn minutes to load one game that's probably less kilobytes than the text document i wrote this script on and like i said even unlocking the frame rate and the emulator still takes a long time. I've sped up the emulator, made like a macro and took a hyper dump in the toilet, came back and it was still loading. <sighs> yeah, it ain't looking so good for the old Commodore. So what do you have for a controller on these things? Well, that's where you can get creative. It uses a 9-pin, just like an Atari and a Sega. So you can use an Atari or a Sega controller. Or you can do what lots of people did and go out and buy a third-party joystick. Let me tell you something. 9-pin joysticks are a hell of a rabbit hole. You have so many companies, designs, and variances in build quality, and joysticks that have more than one name, depending on what store sold it, and different amounts of buttons on each one, which is ridiculous because the the C64 can only register one button 
So all the buttons on the joystick all do the same thing. Now I wanted to play these games with an appropriate controller, so I ended up buying a few different joysticks. Here's the Suncom TAC 5, the one I use the most. This stick has micro switches in it like a real arcade joystick. They make noise too. It's really loose though, and for some reason you can twist the stick. I know modern USB flight sticks let you do that too, but this one does it because it's made like shit. And here's the quick shot too. This one's funny because it doesn't have micro switches, but they intentionally made the switches clicky sounding to make you think it did. Damn! I actually have one taken apart right now because they were made so cheap that one of them has a bad solder joint and won't go to the right, so it probably didn't work when it was new. Anyway, you got your crappy joysticks, you got your slow-ass floppy drive and your tape deck, and you're ready to play some C64 games. So, what do you play? How about pirates? You know, I could make a joke about the fact I downloaded these ROMs, but I'm not gonna. Okay, let me go ahead and edit out the three and a half minutes this screen was up. So basically, you just create a character here, and then you become a captain of a ship. So after a little bit of story, a little bit of text, I'm fighting the captain of a ship that I'm trying to take over. It immediately becomes clear to me I should have read the manual. I jerk the joystick around and tap buttons, and sometimes I hit him, but mostly he hits me until I surrender. <laughs> Continue unpromising career. <laughs> you know what? Let's do it. Insert disc side two. Oh, already? There's a lot of reading that goes into this game. I guess back then they just expected you to use your imagination. So I go to a bar and some people want to join my crew. I sign them up. The factions do faction stuff. I buy some lamp oil rope and bomb from the merchant and we are sailing and boy i didn't know you could put tank controls on a ship you push up to accelerate and then turn either way i found a ship while i was out there and away we go it was only then that i realized i don't have any ammo so my new strategy becomes maneuver this tank controlled ship to the other ship and ram into him and apparently that triggers something and I'm back to this sword fight again. And here I am trying to figure out how this works again while they're feeding me all this new information down here. It is then that I find out that you can actually take too long to do this and lose all your men and you automatically lose. But even after you lose all your ships and all your men, the game still keeps going. Now I'm on an uncharted island living with the natives. Then one of my old crew members found me and then I went back to captaining. So we sail forth looking for the bobcat booty. We find another ship and the whole whole process starts all over again. This time I've got some ammo, not that it helps, I can't aim the cannons for shit. And after two and a half minutes of embarrassment, die. Okay, I think I figured out what you're supposed to do on the sword parts. You hold the fire button down, and then you push up, down, left, or right, or whatever to use the sword. There's apparently a way to block, but I couldn't figure it out. After I figured that out, I just started going to the ships as fast as I can to go straight to the sword part. The game has got a lot going on for something on a computer from the early 80s. It just takes so damn long to load, and when the game does play, it's really slow-paced. However, I have heard there's remakes of this game that are way better. I need to try one of those one day. By the way, this is what the C64 looks like when you turn it on. Yeah, the GTA Vice City intro. There's not really much you could do here other than load your games. Or you can make the computer say things to you. This machine just called me an asshole! Airborne Ranger. Now, the funny thing about this game is the closest thing I could compare it to is Fortnite. You're given a mission, and then you're supposed to drop yourself wherever you want on this map. Where we drop it, boys? When you get down to the ground, the first thing you notice is that the controls are really weird. It's like tank controls times 10. Instead of the joystick moving you in the direction you move it, your character has to rotate to that direction really slowly, then move that direction. And since the joystick is an analog, it takes a while to position yourself where you want, especially in a gunfight. The enemies ain't what kills me, it's the damn mines! <laughs> It seems no matter what I do, I step on a mine. And when you do, it's game over and you have to wait a full minute for the game over screen to pop up. I even had one instance where I spawned directly on top of a mine. How the fuck is that fair? Okay, let's fucking make a game where as soon as you start, you die. And then the game uninstalls and then it sends you a virus and it sends your mother your entire porn collection. We'll call the game Life's a Bitch. Barbarian. Now this one wasn't too bad. It's a two-player fighting game with swords. The controls feel kind of clunky, but you do get used to them. 
basically every direction on the joystick is its own move and you can actually hold the fire button down and get a whole new set of moves. It took me a while to figure out what controls work good and what don't and the game is kind of slow paced but it's all right. I can't say the same thing about Barbarian 2 though. It was pretty shitty. They like kept most of the moves from the Barbarian game but then tried to make it into an action adventure type of game and basically it's Mortal Kombat mythologies. The enemies have way too much health. They're almost like little bosses in and of themselves. This is the first monster in the game and it's taken forever to kill him. Ah, there, shit. Oh, what, I guess this is lava then? Well, jump over it. Jump, jump over it. Jump. Oh my god. Okay, let me explain something. Up is jump, but you don't just press up. You have to get a running start, then press up. And by the time I had figured that out, another enemy spawned in. Uh, this is the first screen of the game, man. First screen. Finally, a jump, and an awkward one at that. The controls are so damn unresponsive, every little jump feels like a miracle. Okay, now it's just trolling me at this point. So fuck this game and its mama. I'd like to take this time to tell you about the absolute best thing about the Commodore 64, and that is the SID chip. It makes the sound and the music on the C64, and if it weren't for this little chip, chip tunes would not exist. Because you could be playing the world's worst Commodore game in the world, and it have some banging awesome music. Case in point, one of the most famous Commodore 64 four songs in the world, Comic Bakery. <laughs> some catchy shit. You know, I had probably heard about half a million remixes of this song before I finally heard the original. There's even a remix of it on another game, Jurassic Park for the NES. So what is Comic Bakery? Well, basically, you've got bread on a conveyor belt, you push these switches to keep it moving, and you gotta keep these raccoons from stealing it from you. The raccoons on the bottom ain't no big deal because you hit them with a stun gun. Yeah, shock the little bastards. You keep moving the bread across the belts until 5 p.m. when it tallies up your score. What's funny is even if you don't get any bread at all through the conveyors, it still takes you to the next level. I never figured out how to keep that raccoon at the top from eating your bread. Maybe there's a method I don't know about. Either way, game's okay. It gets a pass. Commando. Now, I've played this on the NES before, so I've got something to compare it to. The NES one did not have this banging soundtrack, though. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, you can bob your head to that. Yeah. Oh, I was rocking out to that, man, shit. It's considerably harder than the NES version, and the NES version's pretty hardcore. For one thing, it has these points where the scrolling stops, and then there's just a fuck ton of enemies coming out this door. It's pretty damn brutal, and I only got this far by having infinite lives. Then the second level sticks your ass to a cheese grater. One thing I didn't like is that the grenades are bound to the space bar, so you have to hold the joystick and keep your hand on the keyboard at the same time. Doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of a controller? Imagine a game where you have to use a mouse, a keyboard, and a controller at the same time. Uh, yes, our target audience is hentai tentacle monsters. So basically, my review is play the NES version, but listen to the C64 version. Clyde Radcliffe and Torture Trouble Creature- Excuse me, I wasn't done reading! I will never know what it is! Wait, who well, this might be the cutesiest game I ever played on this thing, but don't be fooled by its child-friendly exterior. The person that made this game is a pure sadist. Okay, class, today we're going to learn about It's Detection! When you are making your games, it's always important to make the hitbox twice the size of whatever object you're making. Okay, so what I can gather from this game is you're supposed to get to that bomb. Now, what is the bomb for? I have no fucking clue, because I didn't get that far. This seems to be one of those memory games where you're supposed to make these absolutely precise movements in order to defeat the enemies. It kind of reminds me of Ricky and Vicky, a game I reviewed years ago, except this game doesn't have cute toony fox furries and 
cool music. And that game was actually good. This game is borderlining on impossible unless you have the reflexes of a Smash player. And I don't, but unlike Smash players, I have a life, so... How about a death montage? You are dead. Defender of the Crown was boring as fuck. That's my review. <sighs> I mean, I could try to review it, I guess. I don't know. Robin Hood's in it for like two seconds and not the good one. The one that puts the knot in Nottingham. There's a bunch of strategy game stuff and we're supposed to believe this is an epic battle of some type. I've seen fan-made epic rap battles that were more epic than this. You know what? I should green screen this. Here's Dixie. Friday the 13th and you thought the NES one was the only one. You and nine friends are spending the summer holidays at Crystal Lake Holiday Camp, miles away from civilization. Blah, 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 blah. Jason is waiting. Blah, 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 kill Jason. <laughs> da, 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 da. How many games use that? Fuck. Well, first you gotta go find yourself a weapon, then you gotta start looking for Jason, who looks more like Michael Myers than he does Jason. How do you know where he is? Well, there's a musical cue that starts playing when he's out and about, but it's not enough to just go look for him. He disguises himself as some of the other campers. And if you don't find him in time, this happens. <laughs> That's okay, I didn't need my ears today. There's 10 children on the map, including you, and when they all die, that's it. I never was able to kill Jason, but Jason killed me one time. You seem to have lost your head, what a shame. <laughs> What's weird is you have to attack other campers to find out if they're Jason or not, and you can accidentally kill them doing that, so you could do a genocide run of this game and just help Jason out. It's actually more fun doing that than it is killing Jason. The government was right, video games are turning our children into serial killers. And when I say it's more fun to not play the game correctly, I mean this game isn't fun at all. Most of it is just walking around these same map screens over and over trying to find Jason while this loud, awful music plays. Anyway, this game is just crap and I hated it. I hope whoever made this game gets stuck in a sleeping bag and smashed against a tree, man. G.I. Joe. Now this one I've got mixed feelings about. There's two types of levels in the game. One is pretty good, actually, but the other one is terrible. In the bad one, you get four different vehicles to choose from. A jet, a tank, a helicopter, and a jeep. And they all suck various flavors of ass. The jet is the fastest one, but you can't hit anything with it. Plus, it makes this god-awful noise. If there was an opposite of ASMR, it would be called ACBT, and it would be this game. You want to know the stupid way you aim with this jet? It is not possible! Basically, you don't. You change your altitude, and depending on how high or low you are, that's where your missile is going to aim. How in the hell are you supposed to figure that out? If they gave you a crosshair, maybe you would stand a chance? It doesn't help that you're steadily having to fight guided missiles, and if you get too low to the ground to shoot, you'll hit the damn trees. Plus, it takes 40 miles to turn this damn thing around. As for the Jeep, you can actually hit stuff with it, but it is so slow and you can't dodge anything with it. And the helicopter has the same problems as the jet, except it's slow. So it's actually worse. I didn't even try the tank. If you want to try it, be my fucking guest. It upsets me so much that this level exists in the game and you can't skip it or anything, because you have this level select, but the level select doesn't tell you which type of level you're gonna play. Because the other kind of level isn't that bad. It's a 1v1 shoot em up. You only get to shoot one time, then your gun overheats and you gotta wait for it to cool back down. You shoot it once and it's already disabled. Where'd you get this gun? Wish.com? And I don't remember bullets being so slow you can run as fast as them. Anyway, you just keep shooting him till his life runs out. I think it was possible to play this in two player? I'm not sure. I hope so, because this seems like it would be fun as a two player game. See, I like this. I would rather play this, not this. This should have been the whole game. It's getting a 5 out of 10 because I like half of it. Go sit. Ghosts and goblins? Really? Wonder if this one's hard as balls too. What's that zombie got? A tuba? Oh, fuck off. You spawned right under me. What? What, what killed me? What killed me? Really? Oh, that hit detection, man. Mm. 
Let me remind you that the Commodore 64 has four directions and a button. The button is fire, so what is jump? That's right, up. If you've ever wondered why some bad games have up to jump, it's probably the C64's fault. The devs of whatever game it was probably did some computer games at one point. Well, this is definitely Ghosts and Goblins, but with bad controls. I cannot get past this one damn spot. You know the most aggravating thing about having up to jump is that you have to angle the joystick in a certain odd way to get yourself to jump forward. And it's also possible to lean the joystick the wrong way and accidentally jump. Oh shit, I actually made it to the first boss. Okay, man, you are going down, son. Come on, come on. Don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. Oh God, oh God. Oh, well that was easy. I could not get past this second level, and I think it's because something's wrong with the platforms. They give you just like one centimeter of room to get up on the top of the platform, and if you don't get there, you're gonna run against the wall of the platform. Just watch, when I try to walk up to this platform, watch what happens. It like hits the side of it, and then I fall down. You have to jump on it a very specific way, or else it ain't gonna work. And then there's this spot where I try to jump down to the lower platform, but it only spawns after I've passed Past it. No, it ain't even that. It spawns, but it doesn't catch me. What the fuck? You know, Ghost and Goblins on NES is hard because it's made to be hard. A lot of love, development, and hard work went into making one of the hardest games possible. It's hard, but it was made well. This game is hard because it's bullshit and broken. I give it a fuck you. Out of five. The great, great... G Gianni? Gianni? Is that, is that you, buddy? Sister... Oh, I guess not. The great Gianna sisters it is, then. Man, what is with these games and killing my ears? Whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold up here. Great Gianna sisters. I see what you did. Oh, you even got mushroom. You got Goomba. Look at the Goomba. Guys, Miyamoto is going to be pissed. I mean, what do I say about it? It's Mario, but you press up to jump. So it's Mario with terrible controls. Guys, can you imagine somebody that grew up with Gianna sisters instead of Mario as a kid? They're out there, man. I told you for a while, the British didn't even have NESs. This was Mario. You know what? I'm curious now. Did Nintendo ever see this? Oh, yes, they did. Even though they didn't file a lawsuit, they pretty much ran them out of town, stating, yeah, we know what you did. But you want to know what happened to Gianna Sisters afterwards? The name was bought by someone else, and a new game was ironically released for the Nintendo DS and later another game on the Switch. The Switch game's assets were then later reused by Accolade to make Bubsy the Wooly Strike back. You can't make this shit up. The Mario ripoff got ripped off by Bubsy. If that doesn't put Bubsy in his place, I don't know what does. I guess the last thing we need to see is what is the King Koopa in this game? What is their bot? Oh, it, it's a bug. Just a bug. And you can walk right past it. Next! Hover Bubber. Now this one I loved because it's funny. You're a guy that steals people's lawnmowers and then destroys people's yards with them. And the whole time you're mowing, people are chasing you. And you can send an attack dog after the guy's chasing you to slow him down. You can tell this is a British game too. Oi, off me flowers, you lunatic! And every time somebody steals the lawnmower back, you just go to somebody else's house and steal one. I would describe the gameplay as Pac-Man but funny. So you know what? Yeah, I like this game. A lot of Commodore fans mention Impossible Mission, so we're gonna check that one out too. Another visitor. Wh what? Stay a while. Stay forever. <laughs> B-17 bomber kidnapped us, man. Okay, so what I've been able to gather is you're supposed to search all the stuff in the background to find pieces of a puzzle and then try to put that puzzle together. And the whole time you're trying to avoid these robots. You have a really awkward jump, too. It's not enough to jump. You have to jump forward and roll in the air. Destroy him, my robot. And the jump really turns into a problem when you're trying to do platforming. Ah! Oh! And these robots have a totally fair and smart AI and totally don't camp in front of you. And then you got the elevators, which are simple enough, but make sure you don't go in that little abyss below them. Impossible is right. It's impossible to platform in this game at all, and it requires you to do it. I touched the fucking platform. <laughs> 
And then you got this shit right here where you got to search the thing, get away from the robot, search the thing, get away from the robot, rinse, repeat. This game is on a lot of people's top 10 Commodore 64 lists. And I'm going to be honest here. It's somewhat boring and it's got shit controls. I'm not seeing it. Maybe the sequel is better. Oh yeah, drastic improvement. Now this one is called International Karate Plus, and it's pretty good. As you can see, it's a fighting game, and it's amazing how many moves you have for one button and a joystick. My only complaint is it takes a little while to figure out how to turn yourself around, but once you master it, it's pretty fun. I don't know how the C64 did it, but it managed to have a fast-paced fighting game. The controls are really responsive, the moves aren't too hard to figure out, and it has multiplayer. It's got a lot of good things going for it. And this might be my favorite game on the C64 so far. Where's this game at Evo? I'll tell you this, it's a lot better than Street Fighter 2 on C64. Yeah, the gang's all here, boys. Just like the real Street Fighter, if I did any special moves in this, it's a mistake. I have never been any good at these kind of games. And when you get rid of all but one button, oh, it gets worse. If you thought the Game Boy version was stripped down, whoo, boy. The whole game feels feels so slow and choppy, it just feels like the matches take longer than they actually do. See, this is the difference between a fighting game that was made for the C64 and a fighting game that was watered down to work on a C64. By the time Street Fighter was out, fighting games had evolved so much. If they didn't do nothing but find out a way to get more buttons on a C64, that would have helped. And the biggest disappointment is Guile's theme doesn't go with this game. Now, some of the games I wanted to review for this couldn't work right. So I've got a lot of footage of games that I couldn't actually play. Like people who know their C64 games are probably going to ask me, did you play Raid over Moscow? I really wanted to check this one out, but when you try to get the plane out of the hangar, the door doesn't open. I know you're supposed to push the F7 key to open the door, but I kept tapping the F7 key and it didn't open. Maybe F7 on a C64 emulator and F7 on my keyboard are different. I don't know. So unfortunately, I can't review this one. And then I have some there's just not much to say about, like Karateka. It's just a mediocre fighting game and very slow paced. However, this game is infamous for being able to kill yourself as soon as you start the game. <laughs> I get fucked. And then there's Little Computer People, which is weird. It's a life simulator where you watch this little 8-bit guy, not him, live out his life. This game was apparently the inspiration for The Sims. So here you go, it's the grandfather of The Sims. You're supposed to be able to type commands to him and he'll do stuff, but I haven't been able to get him to do anything. I did get him to do one thing. I took a look on a C64 wiki to find out what commands he answers to, and you have to say please on every order. Order. Plus, he responds to burn and kitchen. So I said, please burn kitchen down. And... <laughs> The Last Ninja. Now, this is another one that's considered one of the best of the best. In fact, I've seen this on number one on a lot of top ten lists. <laughs> Well, the music ain't too bad, I gotta say. Hey, what is that? Can I grab that? All right, give it here. Give it, give it to me. Give it, let me have it. Give it, oh, there we go. Oh shit, I guess we gotta jump on those stones, okay? Oh God, what is that jump? What is it with C64 games and not getting the jump mechanic right? Okay, so I did a little digging. Apparently Super Mario Brothers came out in the UK in 1987, and so did this game. So I'm guessing because of that, British people did not yet know how to program a jump. Gianna sisters notwithstanding. I'll say this, the times that you're not running around clueless like a diseased ferret tripping on permanent marker fumes, you're getting your ass handed to you by the bog standard enemies of this game. Just one simple fight with one simple enemy will take half of your fucking hell. Oh shit, I thought this guy was wearing a reflective safety vest. Safety ninja protects you from harm. Hey yo, it's Buddha. Hey, how's your bombing him? Has anybody ever asked, does Buddha like Fuda? <laughs> Eat my whole ass.
My main problem with this game, other than the jumping, is it is impossible to pick shit up. I must have sat here and tried to get this key in the background for God knows how long. I know you could pick it up. I saw people do it in walkthroughs. And I tried every button on the keyboard. I even found a commit Suzuki button. Don't know why you'd ever need that. And I see people in walkthroughs that can jump through this shit like it ain't nothing. I can't, but I can sure as hell moonwalk away from it. There's a lot of moonwalking in this game. Maybe Last Ninja is dancing to the sick beats. I did figure out what you're supposed to do to pick something up. It's something like you have to duck down, but to duck down, you have to like hold the button down or some shit. And then there's this dragon I couldn't figure out how to get past. Can you imagine? Imagine being a child in the 80s and the C64 is your only means of gaming. There's no internet. Your parents have bought you a new game. It's this one. And this is your new game you're going to be playing for a little while. So you have no choice but to try to figure out this cryptic shit. I don't know, man. I don't know. I got a lot of things to say about this game. None good. Sorry. And yes, I did play the sequels. It's just the same shit. All right, kids, let's change it up. Now, I showed you Street Fighter 2 and I I showed you Ghosts and Goblins, and I showed you Commando, which was on the NES as well. But what other game franchises that we know got on the C64? Well, what if I took... No, nah, no, nah, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait on that one. <laughs> but I will show you Castlevania on the C64. Now, we've heard the C64 do some great songs, so I'm kind of wondering what it'll do to Castlevania. <laughs> That kind of sucks. Well, at least the graphics look okay, and the scrolling is really smooth. The control could use some work. It's not the game's fault. It's the controller's fault. Like I said, four directions and a button. So as you can imagine, up is jump. But if you press up and the button, you use your secondary. And just by muscle nature, I press up and the button at the same time, trying to jump, because my mind is fighting it. No, you have to push the button. No, you have to press up. So I do both. And because up is jump, it's impossible to go up the stairs because you just keep jumping. The game is definitely as balls hard as the real Castlevania, except now you've got shitty controls. I will say this, though. This is not the worst version of Castlevania I've ever seen. That award might go to the MS-DOS version. Okay, let's just have the soundtrack and every sound effect be a car alarm. Um, yes, well, I prefer my music made by door buzzers, thank you. One of my friends has a door buzzer in his house and it goes off in our Discord call. Eater! I'm like, dude, do you live in a store? Snake hip, no fetish drawing motherfucker? How about we look at Donkey Kong, or I'm sorry, Donkey... <laughs> and I can't get it to work. I guess you could say this version sucks, Donkey... <laughs> I can't even say it. There actually is a proper version of Donkey Kong for the C64, and it's licensed by Nintendo. And I'm just as bad at this one as I am the NES version. And you press the button to jump! Praise the Lord! How about Double Dragon on the C64? Well, the music's badass, but the controls are awful. They feel so stiff and unresponsive. This was another one of those games where holding the button down gave you a different set of moves. It controls like shit, it feels shit, the music's okay, but overall... I've got one more that you probably heard of, but I'm gonna save it for last. So let's see what else we can torture ourselves with. Now this would not be a C64 review if I didn't talk about Mule. Mule is a farming simulator, but in space, question mark? You buy some land, you buy some mules, and you mine things, basically. And the object of the game is to just make a bunch of money. You can sell supplies and the stuff you mined at auction or to the other players. Every in-game day you get more land and then you can set another mule down to get resources for you. There's random events that happen. You can win money by gambling. Wait, what does that say? Smith ore. Okay, I thought that said shit whore. Let's go, my little mule. Let's go to work, Imperial Walker looking motherfucker. It's a pretty complicated game for something on the C64, but it's also addicting. It don't have much for graphics, but it doesn't need it. So, you know what? Thumbs up. Good game. The Way of the Exploding Fist. With a title like 
like that, how do I not play it? What do I even say to that? Holy shit! That is peak sound design. I see they come from the Sonic Adventure School of Audio Mixing. This is very much like International Karate, except it's not near as good. In fact, it kind of sucks. And that's all I really have to say about it. I just wanted you to hear the beautiful noise this thing makes. Here's another game that's considered one of the better C64 games. Monty on the Run, also known as Monty Mole. And this is another game that's known for having a super catchy soundtrack. Listen and be amazed. That is what we in the biz call a fucking banger. But how's the game? My God, is it hard. The level is set up like this big gigantic maze that you might have to Google up a map for. There's a lot of dead ends and death traps and shit like that. And a lot of spots where you have to time your movements just right or you're gonna die. Okay, this is gonna smush me, isn't it? Well, I'll just wait for it to, oh! Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm 100% convinced that those smashers have no pattern whatsoever. Yet somehow they can still detect when your ass is under it. The game all in all is a memory game where you just have to learn the patterns of all the enemies. So maybe the smashers do have a pattern. But like, look at this flying clock or whatever that keeps coming towards me. You cannot jump over it. It makes it look like you can, but you cannot. You know what you're supposed to do with this enemy? Stand there. Yeah, it stops scrolling at a point so it won't hit you. And like all Commodore 64 games, the jump is fucked. It's got a set distance it goes, no more, no less. But at least it's mapped to the button and not up this time. But that does mean trying to do precision jumps is hell. And there's even spots where you gotta make pixel perfect jumps or you're gonna die. I didn't beat this game. It is so fucking hard. I know there's people out there that can beat it, but I'm not that person. And I have nothing but respect for the person that can beat this game. Unless you're a Smash player. I hate Smash players. You know what? That was a pretty good game. I like that. How about we end the video with another good one? Guys, would you believe me if I told you there's a survival horror game on the C64? And this is not a recent development. This isn't an indie game that looks like C64. This isn't a recent game. This isn't an Ichio game. This is real. Gentlemen, I give you Project Firestart. You are sent to a research spaceship that has cut communication with Earth to find out what happened to the crew and the scientists, and immediately, shit gets real. Let me take this time to tell you that this game came out in 1989, before games were gory. And this game is very gory. The monsters look kind of ridiculous, but I will say they probably looked cool in 89. This is another game where you better get a map or you draw a map, something, because this ship is pretty huge. And just like a real survival horror game, you have limited supplies, limited ammo, limited everything, and an unlimited supply of monsters. You'll be running around opening computer terminals, reading lore, and the lore is pretty important actually. You're supposed to read it all so you'll know what's going on and so you'll get a different ending. Yeah, there's multiple endings in this game. If I had to say something bad about it, the combat's kind of weak, but I think it's supposed to be. Also, notice that timer down there? Yes, you are timed. So you may have to play this game a few times before you actually beat it, but since there's multiple endings, you'll want to play this game a lot anyway. I can't recommend this game enough, and I'm mad Imagine back then it had to be pretty spooky. I would say I wish somebody would remake it, but you know, we kind of have dead space. So anyway, good game. And that is it for the C64 games. Or is it? I told you I was going to keep one to the end. And I said it's from a franchise you know very well. What is it? I'll show you. No, that is not. Gear. You have to see it to believe it, boys. It's Metal Gear on the C64. I bet you ain't played this Hadouki Kajumbo game. Or maybe you have, because this is the NES Metal Gear. The worst game in the series made even worse. Featuring a 30-second load time to open up your codec. Man, the people who ported this obviously did not know how Metal Gear works. 
the alert mode is gone. There is no alert mode. The soldiers just start shooting at you. When you're punching the enemies, you can't even tell if you're hitting them or not. Oh, that is some expert sprite work right there. Speaking of expert sprite work, I saw for just a split second, there's a decapitated set of legs. Maybe Liquid is controlling them. Does the soldiers just immediately start shooting you without even seeing you? It's actually impossible to finish this game. And it takes 30 seconds for the game over screen to show up. And there we go. We have found a game worse than Metal Gear Survive. And that is all the C64 I can stand. So what do I think of it as a retro game system in 2021. Well, it ain't no NES. I kind of get the feeling that a lot of these games may have been better back when they were new, and there wasn't as much to compare it against back then, especially if you lived in Europe where most people didn't have NES 2600 or anything. So I think there's a rose-colored glasses thing going on with a lot of the people who are nostalgic about this thing. But I also think that about the NES. We tend to forget that for every good NES game, there were like 30 bad ones, maybe more. And it seems to me that that was the case with the C64. And as for me not liking the games that a lot of other people do, I think that's because I didn't grow up with them. But I'm willing to give the C64 another shot one day. I'll even take suggestions on what I should play the next time I do this. Put that shite in the comment section. I can say one thing. I found a whole bunch of new music to listen to. Even in the bad games, the chiptunes were off the fucking hook. So I got mad respect for all those C64 musicians. But anyway, that's the end of it. That's Working Man Games, everybody. Follow me on Patreon. Patreon, follow me on Twitter, but don't do it in real life. I'm paranoid enough as it is. And remember, if we reach our $200 goal on Patreon, I will start making two episodes a month instead of one. You can do the $5 tier or one damn dollar. Anyway, I need to end this video. Bye.